Welcome to Page One, the show for writers with the reader in mind. Here's your host, Zeta Christian. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Page One. I'm Zeta Christian. We're going to go back in time tonight. I'm going to bring you to July 6th, 1944, in Hartford, Connecticut. It's a hot day, it's sunny, and the circus is, circus is in town. Ringling Brothers Barnum & Bailey Circus over on Barber Street. And people come in, crowding in, into the tent to see the circus. Those of you who live here in the area know what happened that day. There was a horrible fire. 168 of the people who went to the circus that day never came home. And countless others, though they did come home, came home with physical and emotional scars. My guest tonight was there that day. She was five years old. Now she's also a writer. And that is why I have asked her to be on page one, because she's working on a book about that circus fire, and she needs your help. Her name is Barbara Wallace. Barbara, thanks for being on the show. Thank you for inviting me. Now, I, um, when I was preparing for the interview, I looked at a number of websites, got some general information about that day, and I want to share a couple details with those in the audience who might not be familiar with it. I mean, certainly people who have lived in Connecticut for any length of time know about the circus oh, yes. fire, but, but in case somebody is new. So this, the tent itself, waterproofed with paraffin and gasoline. Yes. And I read about that and it was, well, wartime. And the, the idea was that the regular waterproofing material was not available. Correct. Another thing I found out was that seating capacity, 12,000 people, there were 6,000 people there that day. 6,000 people, that's a lot. Actually, they're not even sure. They might have even been more because they handed out a lot of free passes. Oh, so that didn't include we the free passes. Oh, don't no, that know makes how it many even people worse. were in there. No. I know. I also came uh, across a little note that when the fire broke out, the band leader, when he saw the fire, instructed the band to play Stars and Stripes Forever, which was the code. Yes. That's something that there was an emergency. When he, when he struck up that music, I remember seeing the acrobats scrambling to get down. So, yeah. And... And, and did you, I mean, even at that age, say, ah, oh, something's wrong here. In fact, I, I want to, you, you have a wonderful essay, and I'm going to ask you to read the essay, which is, gives such a great picture of the fire that day. Um, but I want to get to, because this is page one, I want to talk about the book. So um, why do you want to write the book, and what's going to be in the book? What are you hoping to gather? It started out as a personal essay. Mm -hmm. um, there was a contest for a personal essay at the Connecticut Authors and Publishers Association. And I thought, well, I went to the circus and it's, this would be a very good essay to write. So I wrote it and I won first prize. Congratulations. And I was speaking with Shirley Webb, who is a writer friend of mine. Yes. And I had asked her to critique it because I thought I would send it out for maybe to a magazine or something. Mm -hmm. It's been lying around for a few years. Yes. And she said, why not put it in a small book? And I said, well, I could add some of my dad's pictures. And I thought about it. And then I said to her, you know, I could add other people's stories. And she said, go for it. And the more I thought about it, the more I wanted to do it. Because in two years, it's going to be 70 years. That's a big anniversary. It is. And a lot of people will be gone yes. and will not be able to tell their story. And I think people should be able to tell their stories. So this is a book where you're looking for the stories of people who were there. Yes. Are you looking for any sort of second level stories, people who had family members who were there? Who yes. Heard and, about it. And also people who were going to be there but didn't. Some of those stories are as interesting as the people who were there. They definitely are. Um, any limit? Are you, are you giving people any limit in terms of word count no. for the length of the story? No, no, no. no. Uh, I'm assuming you're going to you know, have the reserve the right to edit for space just, just in case. Yes, yeah. and anything that people send me, 
I am willing to write it and then send it to them for their approval. Because I think if you're putting yourself out there and telling your story, you should be able to have some say about what's said. So I, I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand. Are you saying that you will edit something that somebody sends you, then send it back to them for approval? Or are you, are you having people send audio clips? No. What? Sometimes people will tell me the story, mm -hmm. and then what I said I would do is that I would let them know what I was planning to write to make sure that it reflects how they feel and that they're comfortable and happy with it. I don't want anybody uncomfortable with what I write. I, I'm, for for instance, Barbara, one woman wrote and she yeah. said how she was looking forward to that day, and she put on her favorite pink dress and her black patent leather shoes, and she went, and she said it's something she will remember, you know, the horror and everything, for centuries. And somebody said, oh, that should be decades. I said, no. She wrote centuries. That's how she feels. She's entitled to that. But, but did I'm she write that to you, or did she, she wrote tell that. you? No, oh, okay. she wrote that. And I'm not changing it, because those are her words mm -hmm. and her feelings, and I think we should validate our own feelings. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that what you want from people is something in writing. They can't call you up on the phone they, and tell you the story over the phone. I'd Not rather, that sort of thing. I would rather they put it in writing, in writing because that way I can clarify things. Okay. That, that makes sense. Are you looking for photos also? Oh, that'd be wonderful. All right. Yes. I think what would be a good idea at this point, just because I want to let you know in case you're thinking, well, how, what kind of tone are we looking for? What kind of details are we looking for? I've asked Barbara to share her award-winning essay with us, and she has agreed. So, Barbara, if you would, would you read the essay that not only won first place in the contest, but also inspired the idea for the book? Well, it's called A Day at the Circus Fire. And I'm writing under my maiden name of Barbara Wallace, although my name is Barbara Wallace Felgate, because that was my name then, and people knew me at that point. Um, okay, so Barbara as Barbara Wallace. Barbara Felgate as Barbara Wallace. Yes. One afternoon, when I was a high school senior and hoping to be admitted to a state college, I found myself concerned by the puzzled look on the face of the college admissions interviewer. He had stated that I had done well on the comprehension test, 100% correct and answered very appropriately on the word association test, except for one answer that confused him. Why, he wanted to know. Did you answer fire for the word circus? Why, indeed. July 6th, 1944. For a five-year-old, what could be more magical than a day at the circus? My parents really didn't want to go and sit in the stuffy hot tent on a roasting hot day. After all, they had been to the Chicago World's Fair and had seen um, Gypsy Rose Lee, among other attractions. But a five-year-old is fascinated with elephants and lions, and tigers, and of course the clowns. So we went, heat and all. I really loved the big cats. I was fascinated and continued to watch as they were leaving the cage. Everyone else was looking to the center ring to see the next act. A flicker of light caught my eye. There it was. There, climbing up the side wall of the tent, was a flame, flare of flame that flickered and danced. My mom noticed my fixed state and looked to see what had caught my attention. Fire, she said, and sat down and stood up. Sit down, the man sitting behind her abruptly said, and she sat down. I did not hear the music or the noise of the crowd. All it just momentarily faded away as I watched in awe. I saw the fire grow larger on the very side wall of the tent. Then I noticed three sailors in uniform come running down past the three rings, and I heard them shouting, fire, fire, fire. A stillness descended throughout the tent, and then the music started back up with a completely different tune. The acrobats started to climb down from their perches high above the crowd. Then there was the pandemonium. People were running, shouting, and throwing chairs. There was an oasis momentarily of tranquility where we sat. The man behind us had run past. The people in front of us and beside us were gone too. Then we rose and my father stacked our folding chairs on top of each other. 
so no one trips on them, he told me. Then he picked me up in his arms and followed my mother across the bleachers toward the closest canvas wall. The question now was, would we reach the wall before the flames did? To be answered shortly, how would we get over the animal run since we had climbed up and over and down a small ladder to get to our seats when we had entered the tent? And lastly, how would we get out? The flames were nearing the entrance as we slowly walked along the bleachers. A study in contrast. We were walking, following several others. A man was shouting, get out of my way, and shoving people, throwing chairs with abandon, out of control, as he headed down the bleachers on his way to the floor of the tent. I often wonder if he made it. Some people headed down quickly and quietly, and others ran recklessly down to where the animal run blocked the path to many who had reached the ground. Two women remained sitting like statues in the bleachers above us, as if they could not believe what they were seeing. Women were dragging children down, down to, for some, their deaths. And all along, the flames were nearing the entrance as we calmly locked along the bleachers. I remember looking up and seeing the flames heading towards the very top of the tent. People were screaming. The air was hot. It was thick with smoke and fear. We had come to the end of our row, about seven feet or so above the ground. My mom sat on the edge of the bleacher and just dropped off the edge. She stood below us looking up. My dad handed me down to her waiting arms. I remember looking up, and then he jumped down too. <clears throat> we could feel the heat, and we could hear the roar of the flames, loud, insistent, close, and nearly in our faces. Instead of going over the animal runway, my parents followed it to where it came into the tent. The tent had been staked to the ground where the runway entered. The rope had been cut, or perhaps the pegs had been pulled out. My father just lifted up the flap, and we were free, free to breathe, free to live, free. My father wanted to go back in. He had to rescue the ladies who were, perhaps, still sitting up there on the bleachers. He had to rescue the small children who were still in there. He had to. No. My mother grabbed his sleeve and said, no. He didn't, but I do not think he ever forgave himself for not going back inside. Then we walked about 30 yards or so away, and my dad turned and took some photos with his camera. The tent was gone, just gone. The only, only the skeleton of the bleaches remained, along with the smoke. The screaming had stopped. There was no one to rescue now. So many things come to mind. The man pacing around and around his parked car. The little boy inside crying, I want my mommy, I want my mommy. Did she ever come? I still wonder. When we were still inside the tent, my mom's shoe had come off when the heel had become caught. My dad wanted to keep going, but she refused to leave without it. Now, Helen, I heard him say in a quiet voice, and her reply, it's a new shoe. He freed it for her, and she put it back on, and we resumed walking. But most of all, I remember my parents' island of calmness when all around us was chaos. I still remember the roar of the flames as they tried to claim, claim us for their own. I remember looking up at one point and seeing them consume the tent over the entrance. Was that a glimpse of blue sky through the smoke and the flames, or an illusion? I don't know. But I did think that for a moment I saw the sky. I remember, I remember, more than 60 years have passed, and I still remember, as if it were yesterday. None of this I related to the college interviewer. It simply all flashes across my mind whenever the circus is mentioned, in any capacity, no matter. Just explaining that the circus tent had burned to the ground while my parents and I attended is enough of an explanation. Across the desk, the interviewer smiled and shook my hand. I had passed. My word fire now made sense, perfect sense. In my case, much more appropriate than clown or elephant could ever be. 
Barbara, thank you. My gosh. I think it's the gift of the writer to bring, to bring scenes like that to life and give them the emotion. I found myself holding my breath a couple times. I mean, and obviously I know that, you know, you, you came out okay, but, but all those people who did not, I, I wonder were, was that, that calmness, was that typical of your parents? Yes. Yes. My father believed that until you know what you should do, you should wait. And then when the answer comes to you, then you do it. So I suspect that he was stacking the chairs, not so people wouldn't trip over them, but because he was trying to figure out the best way to get us out of there. That tent was over 500 feet long. And we were, on the, we were diagonally across from the fire, but we were on... For the entrance, we were on the end that the fire was on. And as we were on the bleachers, I saw it over the top, come up over the entrance itself. Oh and when we were on the ground, had just gotten on the ground, I remember looking up and seeing the flames right there. When I talked to my mother about it, she says the same thing I do. I can still feel those flames on my forehead, I, I swear I can still feel them if I think about it. And she said she can too. It was very close to us. Oh my gosh. We were so lucky. I'm so lucky. I do not know whether someone cut the, cut the rope or pulled the pegs out because in reading I saw people, they had, somebody had pulled out pegs so people could get under the tent. I just know we picked up the flap and got out. If that peg or that rope had been secure, we would have been trapped. We had no time to look for any other way out. So I don't know who I should thank, but somebody saved our lives that day. My gosh. And, you know, it goes with you for years. I have a friend who was there who hasn't been able to talk to me about it, but has talked to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I've heard other people say the same thing she did, so I'm not really targeting anyone, you know. Um, but other people have said the same thing, that they remember getting out of the tent, but they do not remember what happened before that point. Some went out through a, where someone had cut the tent, and they went through there. Some went under the tent where the ropes had been mm -hmm. cut, and that's all they remember is getting out. Do not remember the show, do not remember the fire, do not even remember going there. Just oh remember escaping. And we didn't get burned, but my mother would never go in the tent again. And when I go into a building, I know where all the exits are. I was going to say, I, I, I wonder about some of the, the effects afterwards, and that would be, yeah, always looking for the, for the exit. Um, Barbara, I know that that uh, you're just beginning now to get the word out that you are yes. looking for the stories. But even now, with almost next to nothing in terms of, the, of, of getting the word out, is very, very early stages, you're already getting responses from people. I'm getting responses on my uh, email address. People are walking up to me and saying, are you the one writing this, about the circus fire? People are eager to tell about their families who were there or some of their own experiences. Well, tell me... Um, and I know every time that you know we have the ID up, we do have the email address where people can contact you. Um, what kind of release form are you going to have people sign? I have someone looking that up for me. I do not know exactly what kind of release form I need, but okay. I have someone researching that. Because we are in the early stages yes, of all of this. Yes, we're very early stages. And, uh, and have you thought yet about how you're going to publish it. Are you looking for a mainstream publisher? Are you looking to do uh, an e-version or a print-on-demand or some, some form of self-publishing that would make it certainly faster to get it out? Well, I was thinking of self-publishing, okay. but you never know. You never know, absolutely. And so I think I was going to ask you about, you know, how would people be able to get it and when do you think it would be available? But it's probably too early. It's too early. For that. Yeah. Well, so we, we know right now we're going to have to have you back on the show, you know, when, when the book is, is okay. you know, put together and, and we have I, the stories. I would love to come back. I know that in looking up a couple of things, uh, in fact, I was on the, a 
the Wikipedia site. And they mentioned, this was a quote from the site, the cause of the fire remains unproven. Investigators at the time believed it was caused by a carelessly flicked cigarette, but others suspect an arsonist. Several years later, while being investigated on other arson charges, Robert Dale Segui, who was an adolescent roustabout at the time, confessed to starting the blaze. He was never tried for the crime and later recanted his confession. And I thought about that and I thought, well, maybe the stories that you're collecting might shed some light on all of that, that someone, just, just as you were a child, suddenly seeing those flames crawl up the side, maybe someone saw someone flick a cigarette that started the fire. Well, when I was sitting there, and I was a child. Yes. So a child, children have their own way of thinking sometimes, and I'm looking at this fire in the middle of the wall with nothing under it, and I'm thinking, how can a fire start if there's nothing under it? On the other side of the tent, which of course I didn't know, right. was the men's toilet. And oh. one of the theories I read about was that maybe there was some straw or something on there and someone flicked the cigarette up there, which would make sense. It would start then. Um, once it burned through, it would be on the sidewall with nothing under it because what was under it was on the other side. Of course. And to me, that sounds very that would logical. Make sense. It didn't start at the bottom of the tent. It started. It in started the middle. in the middle, or not in the middle, but, but yeah, but not at the bottom. Some distance, some distance, some up. distance up. And I the think top. sometimes it's those observations that you know you get enough of those from other people who were there, mm -hmm. and the the little puzzle pieces get put together, sometimes. and maybe you know the mystery, maybe not, maybe solved, maybe certainly coming closer to the solving. Um, have you talked with, you, you mentioned your mom, have you talked to your mom about the book? Yes, I have, but she's, you know, 98, so she's not... Ooh, good for her. She's, uh, she's, she thinks it's a good idea, but her memories are starting to fade. But we have talked about the fire over the years. Mm -hmm. so. so tell me about, um, about some of the other writing. Have you ever done other essay writing or other kinds of writing? Is this the first time you've done uh, an essay like this? The first type of writing, I won a golden key in high school with one of the writing contests, one of the newspapers mm -hmm. sponsored. And I don't even remember what I wrote about. And then I entered the oratorical contest and I came in third with that. And the next time I did writing was, well, my dad became a photographer after the fire. Um, his pictures were published in the Harper Times. And I don't know if that's what started him on that path or not, yeah. but he became a photographer. And when I was in high school, I started taking pictures and selling them to the papers. And then I took candidates at resorts and sold those. And that put me through college. Oh my gosh. And after I got out of college, I had a young child at home and wanted to make a little money on the side. And I started writing for a weekly newspaper and taking pictures. So I've done a little writing, mm -hmm. but not much. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm so happy that you're doing this. And I, I want to just mention to, to the people in the audience, if you're watching and you're just catching part of the show or you just tuned in, I'm Zita Christian. The show is page one. And I'm talking to Barbara Felgate, who's writing as Barbara Wallace. She's writing a book about the Hartford Circus Fire, July 6, 1944. And she's looking for your stories. We show her email address here several times. And if you're sitting in the audience and you're saying, I was there or I know someone who was there and you want to have that person get in touch with Barbara, I want to make sure that people know page one and our sister show, Full Bloom, are on YouTube now. So if you go to YouTube.com and then search for the Zeta TV channel, Zeta TV. We have our own channel now, which I think Wonderful. is so cool. And then you can, you, know, you can just search for Barbara Wallace's name or Barbara Felgate, and because uh, I'll, have, I'll have links for both. Okay. So people can see the whole interview and perhaps share it with some of their friends who might be interested in contributing to the book. But I'm also interested in yes. the stories of the people who didn't go, but oh, yes. almost yes, went. Yes, yes, yes. One woman was one of 13 children, mm -hmm. and she and her sisters were supposed to go. They lived down in Madison, and that day, their car, their dad's car had not one flat tire, but two. Oh. 
And she was devastated until she heard about the fire, and she felt she'd been saved. Oh, my gosh. Were they, were they all going? Was the whole family going? I have going no there? idea. But oh it's mind-boggling. I thought, what if, 13, oh, what if somebody was there with 13 children? How would, you know, it was oh. awful. One, one woman was there with her four children. I believe it was four children, and her sister's two children. And when the fire started and they were leaving, she told her sister's children to stay with them, and the children didn't, and they were lost. Oh. Her children stayed with her, and they got out. I mean, that's, it's devastating what happened. But the peop one friend of mine did get back to people who weren't there, who mm -hmm. was supposed to have a birthday party that day. was supposed to go that day, but his mother decided it was a nice hot day, have his birthday party that day. And this was in South Glastonbury, and someone said that the circus was on fire, and he said they climbed up on the hill, and they could see the smoke from oh South Glastonbury. Oh, my. It was a big fire. That tent was, what, five, over 500 feet long. Yeah. It was about 200 or so feet wide, maybe 75 or 80 feet high. It was a, was big, a big tent. It was a big, big tent. tent. In fact, I think I had a couple here. Yeah, and the tent, the canvas alone weighed 19 tons. Wow. That's that's pretty big. Some of the people who were burned because the pieces of canvas fell, and of course being coated with the wax. Yes. It was like napalm on their skin. Oh my gosh. Oh and my gosh. I I read too that I don't know if I have, I don't think I have the uh, the statistic here now, but I remember reading that several, I think four or five circus officials were arrested. Yes, I heard about. I read about had, that. Do you do you know? Had did they come? Did they come to Hartford? Do you know anything about that? I don't know anything about that. No. There, there was. Um, I know every time you read about it, there have been a number. There have been other books that have been written about mm -hmm. it. There are a number of websites about it, uh, and I know that some of your dad's photos. Unfortunately, we have to deal with some copyright issues, and um, we don't have total clearance. Otherwise, we would have shown some photos today. I, I'm but, looking for the negatives. We have the neg My sister has the negatives. I think. Okay. And we're looking for them. A lot of things have been put in storage. Well, maybe we can uh, in, in, uh, show some of those when, when you come back on the show hopefully. about the book. And uh, we just have a couple seconds left, Barbara, so I'm just going to say uh, thank you very much for sharing thank the idea. For having Thanks me here. for coming to us when the idea is still early and new, so that we get to share this idea with the public and, and hopefully get some input from you in the audience. As I said, Barbara's looking for your stories, not only those of you who went, but especially if you didn't go. And how does it feel to have survived such a, 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 a tragedy? So Barbara, thanks very much for, for being on the show. We'll have you back again when the book is out. Thank I you. I want to thank my, uh, my Page One crew. And to you in the viewing audience, I love to close, and especially with this show, with the words of the fantasy writer Ursula Le Guin, who said, there have been civilizations that did not use the wheel but there have been no civilizations that did not tell stories. So find your story and find a way to tell it. And if your story involves the Hartford Circus Fire, please tell it to Barbara. Thank you and join us again next time. Bye-bye. Food for the crew and guests was provided by Manchester Grill of Manchester, Connecticut and Angelo's Restaurant of Glastonbury, Connecticut. Be sure to send your writing questions and your comments on the book club selection to Zeta at page 1, P.O. Box 1515, Manchester, Connecticut, 06045-1515 or send an email to Zeta at page1tv.com. <laughs>